All right. Well, uh, welcome to everybody. It's thrilling to have a chance to um, welcome you to our 2020 Lo Lois Bloom Lecture. This is, of course, a, our inaugural attempt to do this virtually. Um, so hopefully the system's gonna, gonna work well. I wanted to mention um, just a couple of housekeeping before I introduce our speakers. Uh, one thing, because we are virtual, we're gonna ask you all to hold any questions until the very end of the talk. And then um, after Dr. Hill has finished the presentation, to use that raise hand function in Zoom to ask a question. Uh, Lorreen will monitor the chat, but it's easier for us if people will use the uh, raise hand. So we'll do that at the end. Okay, well, I am really delighted to welcome Dr. Nancy Hill as our Bloom speaker this year. Um, we're very excited. We were just talking about uh, her research topics could probably not be more relevant than they are right now. Uh, Dr. Hill is the Charles Bigelow Professor of Education in the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University. She's a developmental psychologist whose research focuses on parenting and adolescent development. She focuses especially on the ways that race, socioeconomic status, and community context impact youth opportunities for upward mobility. And she also emphasizes the relational supports that fuel adolescents' emerging sense of purpose and how those supports influence post-secondary transitions into college and career. Dr. Hill's current research utilizes the research practice partnership model, and she's a recent recipient of the William T. Grant Foundation's Distinguished Faculty Fellowship that supports her engagement with the Massachusetts Executive Office on Education. She was also recently awarded the Ernest Hilgard uh, Award for Lifetime Contributions to Psychology from Division I of APA, She's a member of the National Academies of Sciences Board on Children, Youth, and Families, and also the president-elect for the Society for Research and Child Development. Very, very exciting. Today, she's going to be presenting on the topic of the end of adolescence, purpose, insecurity, and indecision on the pathway to adulthood. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Lorene, for inviting me to join you on Zoom. When we planned this, oh gosh, Lorene, was it a year and a half ago? We thought that we would have to get a, a date on the calendar so that we could uh, work around the Penn State football schedule. And now, of course, football has been canceled and reinstated, and uh, here we are. <laughs> so I'm going to take a moment to uh, share my screen and see if this works well. And then uh, start with, um, with the slides. Uh, Lorene, can I get a thumbs up that you can see everything? Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the end of adolescence, and, and as Karen said, uh, purpose, insecurity, and indecision, and just really what it takes to make this transition to adulthood. And I'm going to present a series of studies and, uh, you know, that will cul culminate in a broader theoretical um, model. And so I want to start with the controversies, well, some of the controversies, certainly not all of them, in this transition from adolescence to adulthood. And one is, are high schools preparing youth well for adulthood? You know, can a person graduate from high school and be ready to navigate today's economy? And uh, so that's one of the controversies. Are schools preparing youth well for adulthood? Secondly, do youth have the right skills and dispositions to succeed in today's economy? And thirdly, and this is probably the most controversial, are youth taking too long to mature? Are they coddled? Are they apathetic? And what do we make of this idea of an extended adolescence? And, you know, I talk about this in my class with ad, uh, in, uh, on adolescence, and I teach adolescent development here at, at Harvard. And one of the first things that I always ask the students to do is to give me five words to describe adolescence. And what I typically do is ask them at the beginning of the semester and then at the end of the semester and then see, of course, if there's any growth or change over the course of the semester. Uh, as any good developmental psychologist would want to look at change over time. And so here's the word cloud from the beginning 
beginning of my uh, class last year. And so here you can see quintessential adolescent development, identity right at the middle, puberty is pretty big, transition, um, you get some immaturity, sassy, stressful, emotional, energetic, you get all these kinds of things that we can really think about that's quintessential adolescence. But then we start asking, well, if this is adolescence, and we talk about, well, what starts adolescence? And everyone will say, well, adolescence starts with puberty. It starts with middle school. And then we have a more difficult time talking about, well, what then marks the end of adolescence? How do we know when we're done, particularly when we think about this extended adolescence? So we got into this debate um, about what the end of adolescence. So I did another word cloud right on the spot. And I said, well, what then is adulthood? Give me five words. And here's the word cloud. Responsibility, big and clear. Right in the middle, you also get responsible, responsibility. So you get the sense that it's responsible. Oops. But you also get some of those classic markers of adulthood that we like to question whether or not they've changed. Issues around career and family, independence, finances, marriage, parenthood. You know, as I tell students in my class, you know you're an adult when you've bought like a refrigerator, like you spent money on a refrigerator, you have a real appliance, you are now an adult. And so, you know, what, how do we think about these markers of adulthood? And so you see potential, sacrifice, restraint, I love this. Ad adulthood is boring, taxes, job. I mean, these are what, you know, students think at Harvard about, you know, what it means to transition to adulthood. But the reality is, is that as much as we like to think about the idea of adulthood and, and the transition to adulthood being different today, some of the classic markers are still there around finances, around marriage, parenthood, independence. And in fact, when you look in the, in the theory and in the research, there are five traditional markers of adulthood. And they include finishing your education and finding a job, which are things that people mar indicated in the word cloud before, but also leaving home and finding a life partner, getting married and becoming a parent. And so the markers of, of the transition to adulthood haven't necessarily changed. People still think of these as the transition to adulthood. And what some prior research, Lee and Wickrama and O'Neill Prado found that in order to accomplish the, the lower three on the screen, leaving home, finding a life partner, becoming a parent, that, that youth need to finish their education and find a job. So this navigating the economy and navigating education in order to, to succeed in the economy almost become precursors that, that enable youth to transition to adulthood and meet those other three markers. So then how do we go from this to the transition to adulthood? And so the, with that, the aims of today's presentation are to address three questions, really. One, are we focusing on the most important outcomes when we think about the transition and preparing youth to transition to adulthood? Two, how does the economy relate to adolescence and this transition to adulthood? We talk a lot about what outcomes we should look at, but what, how do we think about the context in which youth are um, transitioning to? And three, what do we make about this press for more time, this extended adolescence and extending the time it takes to make the transition from adolescence to adulthood? And, and what do we think about that? And so those are the three things I want to talk about today. I will, the first and third one are relatively short. We'll spend a little bit more time on, um, on the second one. So first, are we focusing on the right outcomes? Are academic outcomes sufficient when we think about succeeding in, uh, in school and, make, and being prepared to make the transition to adulthood? And so a lot of research, my own included, uses grades and test scores and graduation rates as outcomes. And we do all kinds of things to understand how do we predict them and shape them. And, and you know, in my uh, uh, program of research, we spend a lot of time thinking about what parents do and what parents can do to support uh, academic achievement. 
But then we also say, well, how do we go deeper than that and think about aspirations? You know, I always get, you know, warm inside. What do kids want to be when they grow up? You know, how do we think about aspirations, their career goals? Do they actually go to college? And so for many research, and I'll present some today, we begin to think about, well, well what do, maybe it's not grades and test scores, but maybe we should focus on what kids want to be. And then thirdly, we could think about more, even more deeply than that. Well, what are kind of the mindsets and dispositions that, that youth need to make this transition to adulthood? So if we're not thinking about career goals and aspirations, well, what about cognitive engagement, the ability to plan, the ability to, to assess their options and make decisions and to think about you know, their broader purpose? And these kinds of more cognitive markers were the outcomes of a consensus study from the National Academies of Sciences that came out last year. And I sat on, on that committee as we reviewed the literature to really understand what are the kinds of skills and dispositions. And, and academic achievement and, and aspirations are only part of, of the kinds of outcomes that we should be thinking about with adolescents. So when we look at this kind of this relationship between engagement in school and aspirations and how they function together and how this makes sense among adolescents, uh, my colleague Ming Tae Wang and I tested a, a two competing models to understand how these two function together. So first we looked at parenting practices because, you know, I study parenting practices, why not? Um, but then we also looked at post high school placement. So not just thinking about how well they do in school or what grades they got or, you know, whether they graduated or not, but whether or not they enrolled in college within three years of graduating from high school. And then what we looked at is whether or not engaging in school and their academic achievement led to, their, to improving their aspirations, which led to wanting to go to college. So I do well in school, and because I do well in school, I am encouraged to apply to college. I do so, and I go. Or is it the case that kids develop their aspirations and what they want to do and what they want to be when they grow up, or, and in the case of the way we measure it, that they want to go to college and they want to have this kind of occupation and that gives meaning to their engagement in school. So suddenly, because they, they can put a purpose or a goal ahead of them, now they know why they should perform well in school and why they should stay committed. And is that what leads to, to um, post-high school um, college enrollment? And so we use the Maddox data set to test this. I'm going to show you a complex model, but I'm going to walk you through it. So uh, fasten your seat belts. It will, we won't be long here, but it'll look confusing right at the first. We found significant relations, but there were stronger relationships from aspirations to engagement than the other way around. So here's the complex model. If you can see my cursor, I'm not sure you can. Um, we start with seventh grade parenting practices, eighth grade educational um, outcomes, that's GPA, aspirations, and three forms of school engagement, behavioral engagement, which is, you know, showing up and doing your homework on time, just those kinds of markers of being on task, emotional engagement, their connection to school, and cognitive engagement, their ability to be planful about their work. Those same... Um, indicators at eighth grade and 11th grade, and then three years post high school, whether or not they're enrolled in college. And what we found was that at, um, educational aspirations were more strongly related, even though the reciprocal relationships were significant, but they were more strongly related in the direction of aspirations giving meaning to engagement than the other way around. And then in looking at the parenting practices, we found that monitoring was significantly related to GPA and behavioral en engagement, and especially true for African Americans. And for African Americans, it, uh, parental monitoring was not related to educational aspirations. Parental monitoring was only related to GPA and educational and behavioral engagement. The provision of autonomy, which is you know quintessential adolescent parenting practice, was related to educational aspirations. So we get this idea that parents should be thinking about 
educate they're giving their their youth autonomy and practice making decisions and things like that and it'll help them think about their goals and aspirations which will give meaning to their schoolwork and is related uh, longitudinally to post high school but those relationships did not work as well for blacks for blacks provision of a of autonomy also was associated with aspirations but the african-american parents did less of that than the parental monitoring so the cautionary tale for the African-American parents is that it's a delicate ba balance, that we know that there's benefit to high levels of monitoring for grades and school completion in this study and for a host of other outcomes in other studies, but they need opportunities to make decisions and make mistakes and try things out that will, will benefit their developing aspirations. And so for African-American parents, even though we know that in context, higher levels of monitoring matter and are associated with stronger outcomes, it's associated with those kinds of outcomes of, of behavioral engagement and grades, but not necessarily the kinds of outcomes that help them to dream big and find meaning in their work. So I've sold you on aspirations as driving uh, <laughs> uh, engagement in school and outcome, but I'm going to ask you, is that enough? And so what good are aspirations if they don't lead to a meaningful life? And we see this often with um, first generation college students who have had as a goal to get into college. And a lot of the charter schools and you know, the no nonsense uh, schools that have high levels of discipline, they graduate kids, they get them into college and then they get there. And, and life is hard in college. It's hard to be a first generation student but do they have what it takes inside of them? Forget what we, you know, apart from what we should be doing for them as a university, if their goal is to get to college and that was their aspiration and they got there, now what? And so what we've been working on in our lab is this concept of envisioning a meaningful future. So it's not just about going to college, not just about wanting a one or another job title fill in the blank but why and so we combine this idea of sense of purpose that comes out of bill damon's work which is the you know goals and beliefs that are meaningful to the self that give meaning to them and connects them to the world around them so it's something that is is simultaneously important to themselves they see it as something they are good at it's something they're passionate about and it's something that they can do that will help them find their place in the community in society it's a place it's something that they can do to contribute positively to the society around them and if you couple that idea with nermi's or um, idea of a future orientation not just you know envisioning what they want you know what kind of life do you want when you're 25 and kids will tell you what kind of car they want or what have you but when you think about you know what what do you how do you think about the future? Are you working now to prepare for it? So this combination of having a deep sense of purpose coupled with being future oriented around it, we have called envisioning a meaningful future. And so what we began to do is, is to examine this concept of purpose and envisioning a, a meaningful future and future orientation in a research practice partnership that we have with a couple of local school districts in the area. And here's the broader model for this particular partnership. We have post-secondary outcomes as our outcomes that we're looking for. We're not just looking at college, we're looking at college and career, vocational training. We want kids to have a plan. It doesn't have to be a plan to go to college. It has to be a plan for a, a future that will help them make the transition to adulthood. And we back that out to look at school achievement, school engagement, and sense of purpose and future orientation is here. And then we're looking at school-based relationships, the sense of self over here on the left in school context. Today, I'm just going to talk about uh, part of the model, model that you see here in the box. And I'm going to talk particularly about this particular relationships, the school-based relationships and school context and engagement. And this um, 
partnership it has uh, we followed uh, 1150 students and we did annual surveys with them it's a relatively diverse sample with um, significant economic diversity and racial diversity and some diversity in their plans to attend college the 62 percent that plan to attend four-year colleges is consistent with uh, national averages um, but there's wide variability between their plans to attend college and whether they actually do so the goals of the whole partnership is to improve academic engagement and achievement among the diverse student body, to improve both college and career readiness and college access by focusing on sense of purpose, future orientation, and a sense of efficacy, not just self-efficacy, but um, career efficacy, college-going efficacy, and to de define ways in which schools and families can support youth. And finally, to understand how students think about their future and to and uh, how they find the support that they need. So why parent and school relationships? Don't have to tell this crowd, but parents are the primary source of support. And that's especially true in adolescence and especially true for educational and occupational goals. That even as teenagers are pulling away from their families, they are still asking them for this kind of support around their occupational and educational goals. They're pulling away socially, but they're still leaning in in terms of these goals. And so our framework for parental involvement in education during adolescence, which is something that Don Witherspoon and I uh, collaborated on back when she was a postdoc many years ago. So there you go, Don. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. Um, and then also school-based relationships, looking at teacher relationships and a sense of belonging at school. And uh, this was conceptualized by Belle Liang, who is a colleague and partner with me on this work. And so what we found was that envisioning a meaningful future did mediate the relationship between parental support and academic engagement. And what you see here is um, we tested it with and without the direct effects. We see that it mediates the relationship between parental support and school relationships with academic engagement. The direct relationships were made non-significant with the introduction of um, envisioning a meaningful future. But even non-significant, that those two um, non-significant paths in the model still explain significantly more variance than if we left those direct effects out of the model. And so what we're seeing is that helping youth both have these aspirations and develop this kind of sense of purpose in a future orientation does lead to um, increased academic engagement. So taken together, are we focusing on the right set of outcomes? We would argue from these studies and others that we've done that cognitive engagement and aspirations might be more developmentally rich and developmentally meaningful outcomes. Envisioning a meaningful future, which it goes even deeper around a sense of purpose and future orientation is associated with, with higher levels of engagement. And parental and school-based support matters. And it matters actually even more so for um, African-Americans. So second, how then does the economy relate to adolescence and the transition to adulthood? It's not enough to just want to grow up and have a career. You have to figure out how your career fits with the economy. What kinds of jobs are opening? What kinds of skill sets do I need? How do I navigate this? So we began asking youth, what do they think of, about the job market? And, and does it matter? Do they even think about it? And one of the first times we sent a paper in for publication, one of the reviewers wrote back and said, you know, kids aren't thinking about the economy. And we're kind of like, well, they kind of are. And we're kind of measuring it. And it's kind of related to things. So <laughs> let's, let's talk more deeply about how we can measure it better. So are they thinking about it? What do they think about it? And does the complexity of the job market matter? And so there are two theories that we can bring to bear on this. And one is the student the discouraged student effect. And that theory suggests that when you perceive that the economy is unstable, unpredictable, there are no jobs, that it undermines their sense of, of efficacy. You know, what's the point? 
you know, if, I, if getting a job is, you know, luck and there are no good jobs around, you know, what's the point of being engaged in school? And of course, the counter theory to that is the human capital theory, which has been around for a long time. And that, you know, going back to school is the solution to an uncertain economy. And we see this, that people say, oh, I got laid off from a job. I'm going to go back and go back to school. Or the economy's rough. I'm going to go back to school. And this is, you know, one of my favorite comments that gets at both of these theories. And the one kid says to the other kid, you know, how can we, quote, unquote, get retrained? Because we're, he's assumably hearing that in the newspaper. We need retraining. How can we ever get retrained? I never got trained. So this idea of retraining really reflecting the human capital theory and hey, well, you know, we never really did get trained is uh, the discouraged student effect. Um, and so together we are measuring this by looking at per students' perceptions of the, the instability and insecurity of the job market. Do they think the job market is unstable, that jobs come and go? that there are not enough jobs to go around, it's hard to get a good job. Do they feel like the job market is insecure? You could get laid off at any time for, for, for no reason. What do they think about this? Are they thinking about it? it? Turns out they are. And so what we found, using a very similar model as the study before, is we found that the job market pessimism High levels of job market pessimism, feeling the job market is unstable and insecure, is associated with diminished engagement. We also found that if stu students felt that they were, had strong relationships with teachers and felt like they had high levels of school belonging, it made them feel better about the job market. And feeling better about the job market improved engagement. We see the direct effects between parenting engagement here. We see that parenting practices um, that uh, the model that Don and I developed was not related to job market pessimism, but they were related to academic engagement. We also saw that this relationship, this mediating relationship between school-based relationships through job market pessimism to academic engagement was especially true or more strongly true for whites. But we were curious about this parenting piece. How is it that, you know, maybe the parenting practices which are positively related to engagement, maybe they help the youth think about or make sense of the job market pessimism rather than thinking about it as a, a direct effect. So we looked at it as a moderating effect. And what we found was that the interaction, the latent interaction term of parenting practices and job market pessimism was significantly related to engagement and the direct effects still persisted. And we, in, when we found it this way, we also tested whether the school-based relationships would actually mediate the or moderate the relationship between pessimism and engagement. And we saw that that was true as well. So then, the surprising finding was that contrary to our expectations, that there were stronger negative relationships between job market pessimism and engagement when there were high levels of the parenting practices that we knew were positively related to engagement. So when parents are doing the kind of supportive work that we want them to do, helping kids think about their future, linking education to the future, providing educational advice, those kinds of things which we imagine and hypothesize would mitigate the, the relationship between job market pessimism and engagement actually made it worse. And when we tested the same moderating relationship with school-based relationships, we found the same pattern that kids who had strong relationships to school, positive relationships to teachers, that exas exacerbated the relationship between job market pessimism and engagement. So what we found was support for this discouraged student effect. So for youth who have strong parental involvement and school-based relationships that making really school and doing well in school and achievement central to their identity are the ones for whom feeling insecure about the job market 
made them back away. So if you can imagine if something's really important and central to who you are and you don't feel like you have any control over it because you feel like the job market is unstable and insecure, then you might back away. And so what we argued is that this potentially puts our best students at risk if we're not actually talking about with youth, how do you navigate a job market, particularly when the front page of the newspaper is making you think that it's difficult to navigate. We found this was especially true for those kids whose parents don't have a college degree, which you can imagine are the, those ones who have even fewer resources and social networks to navigate the economy. Sense of belonging at school diminished the discouraged student effect and it was less salient for African Americans, that the discouraged student effect did not impact African Americans as much as, as whites. So then some would argue, well, these are the perceptions of the job market. If perceptions matter though, what does the actual economy matter? How do markers in the economy actually impact how you think about the job market? And so what I wanna talk about next is this, it, it was just gonna set up our third uh, question is that the economy actually becomes a context for transitioning to adulthood as we think about the kind of, the amount of time it takes to transition to adulthood and how youth are making sense of what they need. And so what we know from the markers of the transition to adulthood is that financial independence, finishing your education and finding a job is related to reaching the other markers of the transition to adulthood. So finding a job and, financial, and finishing your education is associated prospectively to leaving home, finding a life partner, and becoming a parent. We also know that youth are meet, reaching these milestones later today. That's all over the popular press and we're seeing it in, in the research. And we would argue that because the jobs that lead to financial independence are scarcer and require additional training, it's taking longer for, for youth to reach financial independence, find the job, finish their education so that they can move on into adulthood. But what's interesting is that the popular press and some current theories would suggest that this is new that something is new about our economy, something is new about the political context, but what we have found is that this isn't new. That this idea of a delayed transition to adulthood is not new to the late 20th century and early 21st century. So if we look at just one marker of adulthood, I'll give this as an example because the pattern is the same for all of them. Let's look at average age of marriage from 1890 to 2010 and the trend continues. If I was there with you in person, I'd ask you to guess what the age of, of marriage, first marriage, age of first marriage in 1890. Take a moment, ask, answer that question for yourself, write it down on a piece of paper. If I were there with you, I'd ask you to raise your hand. So just take a guess. The average age of marriage, first marriage for men in 1890 was 26. And this is what the curve looks like. Age 26 in 1890 for men, 22 for women, and then it continues down till it reaches its nadir in the 1950s. And then it creeps right back up until you get in, in 2010, it was back up to, to 26 and today it's closer to 28. And you see the delay of, uh, if, of um, marriage parallel for, for women, but a couple of a years below. And you see this decline between 1910 and 1950 for both men and women. And so the trend is increasing now and the number of unmarried people or never married people is also increasing now. So the question that, well, well what's happening in, in 1890 that would make it look like 2010? We argue that college then prepares for youth for careers, 
but it delays adulthood and that's what's happening now and it's kind of what happened we argue in in the early um late 19th century early 20th century because what we also found if you remember that 1950 dip college educated women in 1950 their average age of marriage was 26. It was the same. The same as it is today. And very similar to what it was for men who were making the, the transition to adulthood and finding a job in 1890. So in 1970s, there's a gap between age of first marriage between high school and college existed. And today, the college marriage gap is, is, is closing. This gap between those who graduated from high school and those who graduate from college is closing because it, it, in 1890 to 1920, there was a change in the economy, which meant many men and some women who were coming out of the agrarian economy were not prepared for the new industrialized economy. And we're seeing that very same thing now. And at that time, between 1910 to 1940, we had the high school movement, where you had numerous high schools open across the nation as a movement to prepare youth, one, to get them off of the, the streets and prepare them for the new industrialized economy as, as people were moving from their farming areas into the urban areas and thinking about how do we prepare for this, this new economy. And today, our high schools may not and are not preparing youth for the the economy in which they inherit so it's harder for youth to come out of college and enter the job market and make a living wage which will enable them to make this transition to adulthood whereas college delayed the transition to adulthood as youth prepared for careers across time we're seeing this again newly for kids coming out of high school so the desire to be financially stable before marriage remains, but the ease in which youth can enter the job market is related to the transition to adulthood. So then how does the economy um, relate to adolescence and the transition to adulthood? One, if, if youth are daunted by the economy, which we find that they are, that if we know from history that a tough economic backgrounds and a lack of career preparation delay the interest entry to adulthood, then we must acknowledge that it takes more time to make this transition to adulthood. So that leads to the, to the last question. What does this press for more time mean? Why should it, be, should it take more time and what should we be doing with it? And so, the final questions, set of questions that I want to address are, you know, is there evidence that there's an extended path to adulthood and whether or not it existed in prior generations? Right now, I've just said, you know, they're marrying later, they're leaving home later. You know, but is it because there, there is this need for an extended path to adulthood? Do youth need more time to make the transition to adulthood? And if they do, are we shortchanging those that we press into maturity at age 18? Because this idea of an extended adolescence, an extended transition to adulthood is really only granted to those who attend a residential college. Everyone else, better find your way. So if that's the case, how should adults spend their time or young adults spend their time as they make this transition to adulthood? And this, is the, the focus of a book that my colleague Alexis Reddy and I just finished. We just got the copy edits this week and sent them back. It'll be out in March with Harvard University Press. It's called The End of Adolescence, The Lost Art of Delaying Adulthood. And we argue that it is a lost art, that it's not new to today, that it's something that, that youth have been doing all along. Those who attend college have always had the privilege but when youth have had a difficult time going from high school into the economy, it, in does, it does indeed take longer. So what to do with more time in the transition to adulthood? If they're taking more time, well, what should they be doing with it besides, you know, living in their parents' basement and 
playing video games, but I don't know any kids like that because there are none in my house, right? Right. Okay, truth in advertising. <laughs> so what should they be doing with this time? And so this study is based on a set of previously unstudied interviews from the class of 1975. These are Perry's students who developed a co the um, college student development theory on ethical and intellectual development. And um, this set of studies we actually found in the archive. There are 104 interviews from 30 students. 20 were followed annually for four years. 10 additional students had two to three uh, interviews over the course of their four years. All of them had their freshman interview and their senior interview. We did a qualitative analysis, grounded theory analysis, and axial coding. So when Perry did this study, he had developed this theory on college students' ethical and intellectual development over the course of the, of the 50s and 60s. And what he argued, much as we often do today, was in the context of the civil rights movement, in the context of women's liberation movement, and the Vietnam War, and uh, Nixon's resignation, the, out, uh, the, the riots on, in, and um, conflict on campus, surely youth today, back in 19, 69 are different than the youth before and he set out to understand that difference he collected all of these studies they analyzed a lot of the data and they concluded that the study yielded no differences between the college students in the 1970s compared to those college students in the 1960s 50s and 40s so he packed it away all neatly in the attic of the bureau of study council at harvard and Alexis Redding, then a graduate student, now a full collaborator, bumped into this box of reel-to-reel -reel tapes, knocked them over, brought them out, looked at them, and came to me and said, do you think these are interesting? And we went through the process of getting them off the reel-to-reel -reel tapes, translating them, transcribing them, coding them trying to fit them in a journal article because that's what I do. I write journal articles and then we realized what we really had was a book and this is it. And what we've learned, the, the, the focus of the study, the method of the study, they would come in at the end of the year and they would sit down and the interviewer would say to the student, what stood out to you this year? And then the interview unfolded for anywhere from 40 to 80 minutes based on what stood out for them. There was no other protocol other than following the vagaries of whatever the student said that stood out for them. And this is what we found. And it's useful, I think, to us today. We found that kids, it's beyond the academics, that they don't go to college for the classes, but we knew that already. We just didn't know how important the other things were. They talked about leaving home and being able to return home as a new person that reconciling those relationships at home. They all talked about going home at Christmas and not being the same person, not fitting in with their old friends, their parents not understanding them, them desperately wanting their parents to listen to them and their parents wanting them to be their old self and they were never gonna be that old self again. How do they come leave and come home as a new person? How to embrace loneliness that we know from epidemiological research that as many as 60 to 70 percent of college freshmen experience extreme loneliness. But in the process of this, they learn how to build new communities. And if we live in a global and mobile economy, how do we, how do we train youth up to leave home and come back as a new person? How do we train them up to go away, experience loneliness, and learn how to build new communities from scratch? Third, learning the skills of self-discovery. We desperately thought we were going to hear that students found themselves in college, that they solved the identity question of who am I and what am I meant to be. They never solved it. But they developed all of these skills of self-discovery, all of these skills about you know, what's quintessential them and what was what could be tossed away? What are the standards by which they judge something is there about them or is them or is truly them and what's not? And how do they develop those markers? So they didn't find themselves, but they call, talked about all of these skills and 
and ideas that they learned about how they discovered themselves, how they tried to get rid of all of their biases and become clean slates and then figure out what they were going to take back from their, their growing up and what they were going to reject and the process of doing that in a way that they can use again and again over the course of their life. Third, going from purpose to profession. How do they make decisions amid all the options? Co college is quintessential about opening all the doors and giving them all the options. But they talked about how difficult it was to go from the world is your oyster to actually making a decision in ways that line up completely with Iyengar and Leper's research on decision making. The more options you have, the greater the weight the decision make and the less high quality decision making skills one uses. And they talked about this process of, of having to make decisions and the weight of making those decisions. Five, they talked about discovering strengths amid challenges, all the setbacks that happen, the turning points that happen, the failing the course, being accused of plagiarism, being tossed out of an extracurricular activity that derailed your future, studying abroad in a way that opened the, one's eyes and made their current goal seem completely irrelevant. So how do they discover strength in the midst of those challenges? And finally, not surprisingly, they wanted more time. But they didn't want it in this way that we all want more time. They, they felt they wanted more time for particular things, that even as they had gotten into college and that they were now had control of their schedules, they really didn't. That the, the constraints of the major and the constraints of the requirements didn't enable them to actually make good use and they didn't have good guidance about how to make good use with this time that they had in college. They talked about courses, but that really was, that was just to get them there. It was this kind of stuff that ended up being the meat of what they were learning in college that was going to serve them well as they transitioned into adulthood, transitioned into the economy and made sense of the life that was before them. So there are other benefits to delaying the entry of adulthood. There's better physical and mental health and lifelong earnings and life satisfaction if when youth enter adulthood at later stages. We know from neuroscience that the brain continues to develop into the mid-20s and you get increases in self and emotion regulation and motivation well into the 20s. And we know that the brain development is experience expectant. And it's deepened and depends on the environment. So when even young adults into adulthood are in truly stimulating environments, it creates neuro patterns that enable them to be flexible into and cognitively flexible into a later adulthood. So what do youth need to mark the end of adolescence? They need these aspirations that we talk about, but they need them connected to a deeper sense of purpose, not just wanting to go to college and wanting a career, which may disappoint, but something that brings deep meaning. They need this cycle of discovery and rediscovery of themselves so that they can take this into their future for an economy that isn't going to be a job that you get in their 20s that you keep till you retire, but enable them to, to transition and see the commonalities across contexts, to build new communities and to build bridges between them, to, to learn how to make decisions and decision-making skills with an increasing array of options. They need cognitive flexibility and divergent thinking for the kinds of skills and dispositions that they need uh, for the future and in, in, in the economy, which will be largely entrepreneurial and problem solving. And they need to find strengths from their from challenges. And they're going to do this in the cons in the context of perceptions of the economy and the actual economy. And they're going to do this in the context of building their own human capital and understanding what what college means as a credentialing device and a signaling device. 
They're going to do it in the context of their own strength, their own sense of self-efficacy and identity, and they're going to do this in the context of community and family support. And so when we put it all together and we think about the kinds of relational supports and family supports that, that are associated with achievement and outcomes, we, come, we bring it together in this model that, that um, my team has developed that, that is a model towards guiding youth towards a meaningful future where you have these skills, mindsets, and dispositions that are at the heart of what youth need to, to learn. And they're learning those not on their own. They're learning them in the context of academic curriculum. And parents are helping them develop these mindsets in the context of their curriculum. And parents, for their part, are not just trying to get kids to do well in school, but how well kids are doing in school is going to shape how they, they parent. And we have another couple of uh, paper that's looking at that relationship in that direction. But then it's not just about how well they do in school. It's not just about post-secondary plans, but those post-secondary plans in the context of understanding uh, the economy. And then you can begin to look at how they all fit together and help youth make this transition to adulthood. So in general conclusions, the pathway through adolescence is about more than, than academic pursuits and identity. It's about envisioning a meaningful future that helps youth see the value and utility of school and why they should engage and that the economy matters for both post-secondary transitions, both their perceptions of the economy and the actual economy. And I would argue that we need to embrace this extended time that's needed to make this transition to adulthood and to help youth make it more purposefully. And that will help us get to from adolescence with its craziness in, in an identity development and self-focus into this land of responsibility and, and connection and con contributing to society. And of course, I have to acknowledge the full team. Uh, with the, we had the school, we work with, in partnerships, so we have school district teams, and then Bell Liang and I have been collaborating for uh, the last five or six years. And for you graduate students who are in uh, the audience, Bell Liang and I went to graduate school together. And then we went our separate ways and found ourselves back in connection and in collaboration just in the last five or seven years. So you never know who you'll end up collaborating with, who is sitting uh, right there in graduate school with you. And then we have a host of doctoral students and master's students and um, our Radcliffe research, undergraduate research partners in funding. And that's what I have, but I'm gonna back it up to this slide because that might be a good place to think about um, conversation and questions. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Well, great. That was wonderful, Nancy. I, you can't hear everybody clapping, but... <laughs> <laughs> it is an odd thing. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure they, um, they really enjoyed it as much as I did. Very, very thought-provoking. So we're going to go ahead and move on. We have time for questions. And so um, if you can just find your um, raise hand function. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing screen so I can see the raised hand function. Okay. But if necessary, I can pull up a slide very quickly. I might, if, if I don't see a raised hand, I mean, I'm not sure what I'm looking for exactly. <laughs> I don't see a raised hand and I know what I'm, and they usually pop up on the, in the person participant page. So we'll let people digest for a minute. We can I'm going to say or I'll dive in with a with the first question. We were talking about this just a, a little bit before you started. So I know you can only speculate, but what is your sense of what the pandemic conditions are going to do to this whole process you've been talking about? It, it just seems, I mean, you talk about the economy, but also um, the, the college opportunities that the, it's like they're extended in transition time, but maybe without the same opportunities that would usually bring. I don't know. What, 
but any I've, any guesses about what's happening i have i thought a lot about it um we are beginning to collect data with um, some the high school students about their perceptions of what they're getting out of high school that's preparing them but we're also in, in our you know kind of policy informing policy role is really helping people think about these other things that they need i think we are in a moment i think before the pandemic where people were questioning you know what's the value of a residential college experience for example and people would argue well you know you can you can take the courses online and you can and we now know you really can <laughs> and so what's the value of coming to a residential college experience and that's one part of it and the value is all of those other things it is about learning how to build community it is about separating and reconnecting in a new way to family and these are you know kind of frivolous coming of age kinds of things these are kind of these are essential socio-emotional cognitive skills that match onto the economy that we currently have but i would also argue that college isn't the only place in which you can get these skills and as we think about th this particular book and this work, it's not that we're saying, oh, colleges need to do this, although we will tell colleges that they need to do this and that. But wherever we find youth, we need to be thinking about how to help them make decisions. We need to think about how to help them find their place in a new economy, how to think divergently around problem solving, how to see the skills that they're learning in one context transitions and applies to another context as we imagine youth moving from job to job and needing to be both mobile from one job to the next but also mobile geographically and train them up on those skills and i think that's the kind of economy that we have and we need to encourage our high schools and our colleges to prepare youth for that kind of economy and I think there's part of it is that kids go to college. The privilege have always gone to college, right? But what are they getting that they really need? And how do we enable all youth to get those things that they need with or without going to college? So we're looking at this as applying to the military, applying to management training programs, um, applying to you know, um, foster care transition, you know, the Chaffee programs, like what are these other mindsets and skills that were, that youth aren't getting in high school that's making them feel like they have to do something educationally after high school because what they got in high school didn't prepare them for the economy. In the very same way in the early 20th century, what youth were getting in their primary education no longer prepared them for what they needed to do to succeed in the economy. So the high school movement steps in, prepare, begins preparing youth for a very different kind of economy. And I think we need to do that again. I did see there's a, someone sent me a chat. Um, oh, Kiana has a question. <laughs> but, okay, I'm just gonna Can read you it. just say it out, <laughs> yes. Kiana? Um, okay. Uh, she's interested in hearing you speak to other aspects of the family system that might influence adolescents' feelings of aspiration or connection to school and their futures. Mm -hmm. Do you have data examining, for example, the sibling impact on these outcomes? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that peer influence would potentially moderate those associations? Mm -hmm. Yes and yes and kind of. <laughs> So we don't have um, quantitative data on siblings, um, but in our qualitative data where we developed the framework on uh, family school engagement for adolescents, it was really interesting the number of teens and parents that talked about using themselves and others as a model for what they should or should not do, right? <laughs> and so, you know, be more like your older brother. Don't be like your older brother. Be more like your uncle, you know? And so really trying to pull out those models, both positively and negatively, um, of, 
about you know what kids should do and the models that they should take we do have a little bit of data on um, peers but all, we're not peer researchers and we think about you know people who really do peer research well which is a lot of people at Penn State you really have to think about networks and so you can't just ask people about their peers you really have to think about well, who are these peers and how do they cluster and things like that but we do have um, some data on perceptions, youth's perceptions of how much their peers value education. Um, we haven't published anything off, uh, from it yet, but we're, we saw some, some positive relationships. But I think you're exactly right to think about these systems. And I think these systems are even more important now than they were because kids are home and youth who were planning to go to college aren't going to college. And so they aren't launching in the way that they thought they were going to do, their parents thought they were going to do. And so they are in this kind of frozen space and time. And I think after this, we're gonna to have to argue, well, well, why wouldn't we just do college from your bedroom in adolescence? And if that's, you know, how do we make a case for getting these other kinds of needs and experiences if we don't come back to a residential college experience or some other college experience. I, I think there's another question. I'll just read it. <laughs> um, in your research, do you have any specific findings for first generation students? Are there any indicators, particularly in your model within the stages? Mm -hmm. um, we did not track in the in the research partnership data that I showed you we did not track first generation what we are doing right now though is collecting data on immigrant youth in particular in a research practice partnership in part because in this partnership this the district is particularly interested in the influx of immigrant students and the challenges that they have and the teachers have in serving these students well. And so as they move out of the ESL classrooms and the shelter classrooms and the mainstream classrooms, there is a gap between the kinds of language skills and other skills that they need to succeed in an English language academic classroom they can pass the proficiency test that gets them out of, and in many cases pushes them out of the ESL sheltered classroom, but their English isn't quite ready to really tackle, say, chemistry in high school in English. And the teachers struggle with that, and teachers vary in you know, how much they, they are willing to work around that and so we're looking at teachers perceptions of how prepared they are and how confident they are and how willing they are to do what it takes to serve these students um, and then we're also looking at the students experience in the middle of the data collection one of my uh, doctoral students uh, Paris Stu uh, Masumi she was doing qualitative interviews tracking students and following them from these sheltered classes into the the um, the uh, mainstream classes and then the pandemic hit and she's like well what do I do now I can't collect data I'm like get on the phone collect data on the phone so we are collecting interview data qualitative interview data of ESL student immigrant students experience with remote learning in the context of the pandemic stay tuned I don't have findings yet she's still, I think she's interviewed I think 30 students so far so more to come Other questions? Um, I don't know. Can you see these questions? I can see it. Dawn, you yeah. should speak up. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts about the... Wait a minute. It went away. Hi. There Hi, you Nancy. go. Hi. Hi. Yes, yeah, so I was um, wondering your thoughts about the racial differences that you um, found when thinking about, you know, school belonging and the job um, pessimism and things of that nature. Like, what are your thoughts about those kind of strengths of the associations between, you know, kind of the variables of interest or are there any other variables or indicators that we should be considering mm -hmm. um, in relation to the uh, 
racial ethnic groups or is there some other underlying factor that might be contributing to the difference? The racial differences, that's a great question, Don. The racial differences are really interesting to me. Um, when with the Maddox data set, the Hill and, and, and Wang paper, it, the, the findings around the benefits of monitoring I mean, it just didn't surprise me because it, you, you just see that again and again. It's not just with, with African-Americans, but with every uh, minority group, whether it's an ethnic minority group or a, an income or economic minority group, where you just get less second chances. You just get fewer second chances. You just get less slack. And so the need for parents to be strict, the need for youth of color boys, African-American boys, to not make a mistake because making the mistake is ultimately more costly on average, then those, par those parents, you have to be strict. That didn't surprise me. What surprised me was that, oh my gosh, they still need autonomy granting. They still need to make mistakes and, not, and they still need to figure it out themselves. And the cost of not having the opportunity to experience that kind of parenting because the risks are too great comes at the cost of their ability to um, develop their aspirations where they should have wide open opportunities to think through what they want to be and they just don't get the kind of freedom to do it and that struck me and it and it struck me hard and it really um it called into question you know a lot of the 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 charter schools that where you you know you see kids you know african-american kids walking in lines wearing uniforms ties on and yes ma'am yes sir and they get great test scores and they graduate and they go to college and they don't make it past their freshman year and it really gave answer to a lot of that 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 they do need the same kind of beanbag chairs and the other things that private schools of wealthy kids get they need that but society will not give them the the freedom to make those mistakes. The second thing I'll say, because you can believe that that was all one thing. The second thing I'll say about it, this was that um, the, the African-American students were less daunted by the job market pessimism. And by the data, you know, African-Americans you know, they're, they, you know, if you think about years of education and, and um, income earned, there's a, a lower return on the years of education for African Americans. They have every reason mm -hmm. to say this doesn't work for them. But they are undaunted. They are less daunted. I shouldn't say undaunted. They are less daunted. The other thing that was interesting is, is um, Whitney Polk, who is a doctoral student of mine, who's now postdoc at Penn, she does a lot of work on um, disproportionate discipline and its impact on students feeling like they're connected to school, their sense of connection to school and things like that. And we, and then another postdoc, uh, Diamond Bravo did work on attributions of discrimination. So kids said they felt discriminated against, how did they attribute it to whom and to what aspect of their identity? And for the African-American kids, they might not feel like they're connected to school. They might feel marginalized by, from school when we looked at the data on their belief in education, their commitment to education, their belief that education is important, mm -hmm. undaunted. That even when they experience high levels of discrimination, it doesn't make them waver about the importance of education. They line up on that human capital theory every time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really interesting. I think we have time for one more question and Laura has one. Yeah. Hi, Laura. Hi, hi, Nancy. I really enjoyed hearing that. That's 
And I look forward to seeing your book as well. So that's great. Uh, one short question that maybe has a long or a short answer. What about sex differences? Did you look at it? We looked at sex differences and in, um, we didn't find a whole lot of sex differences along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a school that um, assesses gender non-binary. And um, one of my doc students began looking at discrimination based on, on um, non-binary gender identity um, and discrimination around, you know, multiple identities and things and um we just didn't find a whole lot of clear gender differences um in the in the studies that we we looked at good thanks mm-hmm. all right we're right at uh almost at five thirty, so i think we should probably um call it a uh end but this was just really really fantastic nancy i mean you're um, research is excellent, but also you're just so thoughtful in the way that you describe, you tell the story that's just captivating. So I, I think I speak for the whole group. This was just fantastic, really, really a wonderful uh, end to our day today. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. It is, I wish I were there with you. Uh, this is second best, but I, I'm thrilled to be here and to share this work with you and to, to have the conversation. So thank you so much for inviting me. I wish we had the thunderous applause. Just <laughs> give you a sense of how, oh, look, people are putting up there. I don't even know. Yes, I see the chats. It's great. <laughs> Some people are better at this. Eh? <laughs> That's great. Well, thank great. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye.